believe, but Top Chef was considered a risky TV experiment when it debuted in 2006. Leanne Wong was one of their first guinea pigs, as she puts it. 11 years later, she's gone on to produce TV cooking shows, authored a cookbook, and opened the Coco Head Cafe in 2013. Here's the story on how she went from a fashion school in New York to Top Chef stardom. I went to college in New York City at Fashion Institute of Technology because I thought I was going to be a fashion designer. And uh, I majored in fashion design and minored in fine arts. And I did that for three, four years before I decided I wanted to change careers. And that really blossomed out of, uh, I had been working in restaurants, uh, front of the house since I was 15. Um, I was, you know, my job at in New York was I was working at a East Village, sort of like this place called Dojo. We specialized in like soy burgers and like really inexpensive, like sort of Japanese style food. Um, it was a great restaurant, always busy. Basically, I was living in this like 250 square foot apartment in Times Square. I had a futon mattress on the floor and like a box, a little 13 inch box TV on the floor. And by some miracle, I got Channel 50, which was the Food Network. And so I started obsessively watching the Food Network. Broccoli was my gateway food, so broccoli was the first thing that I learned to cook for myself because I love broccoli. And then uh, I would subsequently get into like shake and bake. I thought making like shake and bake chicken and like shake and bake pork ribs was like a big deal. I ended up going to French Culinary Institute in Soho and it changed my life. My first job was at Aquavit with Marcus Samuelson, uh, another very well-known chef. Um, I worked there for three years. After that, I went to cook for Jean-Georges von Richten at Restaurant 66. I did a short stint on the in-between as a private chef for a Fortune 500 company, but I opened up Restaurant 66, which was his uh, Chinese restaurant in Tribeca. After that, I ended up back at the French Culinary Institute as their executive chef of continuing ed and events. So I did basically, I didn't teach classes per se, but I did, I ran and coordinated all of the chef demos. So I worked with not only our deans, uh, Jacques Pepin, André Soltner, Jacques Torres, and Alain Sayac. I worked with every single chef that came through the restaurant. So part of what I did was I basically welcomed chefs into my space and I made them look good. So I was, I was kind of on my own in my own kitchen, uh, working next to some of the greats. I think my most valued time was working next to André Soltner who brought the first great French restaurant to New York City, Lutece. And a lot of what I know and my knowledge and sort of like my work ethic, my work ethos comes from Andre Soltner, who is just incredible. Andrea Emma Robinson uh, was our director of wine, uh, wine education, and she had her own show for Fine Living Network. And I got a phone call uh, from the West Coast, and my manager said, hey, I just met this uh, casting producer. Bravo is doing this new show. It's a culinary show. They asked me if I knew any chefs who'd be good for it. I think you'd be good for it. I was like, would you give me the time off? She's like, well, just audition and see. And so literally uh, this casting director flew to New York the next day. Um, I met with him in the Hudson Hotel. I filled out this like super thick questionnaire. Uh, I did an on-camera interview with him and then I submitted a demo tape and it kind of fell off my radar for about three, four months. I didn't hear anything about it. And then I got a call back and they're like, hey, you've been selected to cast for the first season of Top Chef. And at that point we were guinea pigs. You know, the, the show hadn't been produced, there had been nothing like it. And so the Magical Elves was a production company through NBC Bravo. They flew like 32 people out. They sequestered us in a hotel. You sign this big contract that says, you know, there may be cameras everywhere. So it's very interesting because I'm actually in the hotel, like climbing on the furniture, looking to see if there are any hidden cameras in my hotel room, which there weren't. Um, Got to fill out this like psych exam. <laughs> make sure you're not crazy. Make sure you're emotionally stable to be able to handle a show like that. And then uh, me and uh, 11 other castmates were cast for the first season of Top Chef. We were the guinea pigs. And um, there was no budget at the time. After that, subsequently, they offered me the producing, uh, supervising culinary producer position. I came on, I consulted for season two. Um, you know, at the time, culinary producers, all they really were doing were doing like magazine shoots and food styling and dump and stir shows. There wasn't a show like that, so it was hard. And so they brought me on because A, I had experience from my job at French Culinary, and B, I had in, insider knowledge as a contestant to say like, what, what could make this show better? What could make 
the experience better for the contestants? Basically, we'd start the season. We did about three weeks of pre-production. Uh, I was involved with the casting of the show, so I'd, I'd, work, I'd go through videos, resumes with the casting producers and the executive producers, so I'd help cast the show. So I was basically in charge of building out the kitchen, of ordering all the equipment from our sponsors like Calphalon and some others, you know, like, kind of like more homey sponsor stuff you, you'd find in like Sur La Table. I wanted like real equipment so the, the cooks could actually make great food. So I was responsible for the food inventory, the equipment inventory. Uh, segment producers would come to me with ideas and I'd refine them. I'd say like, this is not going to work. This is going to work. This is the equipment we should use. This is the equipment that we should prevent them from using. You know, it, it was always that battle. I think Tom and I, you know, we'd always kind of argue with the producers on whether it was a reality TV show or whether it was a, a cooking show. And I was like, well, you know, you guys are going for ratings and and drama, and we just want good food, you know? And good food will bring the drama itself, you know, that, that tension that we all carry in the kitchen. So uh, over the years, I ended up getting, I produced also the first Top Chef Masters, so that was the one kitchen that I was like, all right, we're getting a blast freezer, we're getting, I got poly science to donate a bunch of uh, circulators, uh, an anti-griddle, so I got really like, I built out a tech kitchen eventually in the Top Chef kitchen, so it was, it was great. I did everything from build the kitchen to stock the set to food style it out the um, the challenge reveals to doing the dishes, sometimes three times a day, and um, doing all the food porn. We used to have a couple executive producers at Bravo who were who like, she's really pretty. I'm like, that has nothing to do with her culinary skill, you know? And so it was always that battle, like, you know, are they going to be entertainment? Are they going to be a good personality? Or can they actually cook? And eventually it got to be a show where now we're casting for talent, you know, in terms of being able to cook and skill uh, versus looking for that that dramatic character who's going to shake things up, you know, that that's very short-lived. The first season was was very diverse in terms of who was cast, and there were 12 of us. That was, that was it. Now I think they start the season with like 16 or 18 cooks. It's grown. It's quite the beast. They're in season 15 now. I think what you see is a lot of young cooks get into the business and they're like, I want to be a celebrity chef, which is a BS term in and of its own. If you're a real chef, you're working all of your life, you know, and uh, there are food TV personalities and then there are chefs and I to me I'm like you're a chef if you can run a restaurant and you can manage a crew of people everybody wants to be a chef and I'm like there's a lot more involved than just the glamorous aspects what you see on TV and see in the magazine you know I ended up gaining a whole nother career uh, doing culinary production I'm actually still in demand as a culinary producer and a lot of times I turn stuff down I'm like no just I don't feel like doing it anymore every now and then I'm able to produce something uh, I produced uh, Rocco's dinner parties I produced uh, the Delta cabin cook-off uh, uh, challenge so there are you know I do production every now and then when when I feel like it but um, for me, I had done all that. I'd been involved in like the, the food and wine circuit for a while, South Beach, Aspen, kind of doing all the, you know, uh, doing, going to being on camera talent afterwards. So being on Food Network and Cooking Channel, um, having my own shows and uh, doing my own web webcasts and all that. And, you know, for me, the last piece of the puzzle was doing a restaurant. And so the uh, story is I started coming out here. I met a boy <laughs> and, that was sort of the impetus for moving to Hawaii. Uh, doing the season two finale of Top Chef in Big Island was my first sort of exposure to Hawaii. And I actually have Ohana here in Oahu. So it was, I flew over afterwards and uh, I, I met my family. Uh, I hadn't seen them since I was like a teenager. Uh, and they were wonderful. And it was just, they're always like, come on back. You know, you always have family here and you can always come visit. And you know, I started traveling to Hawaii on a regular basis. And then one trip I, I met somebody and I was like, yeah. Well, this is interesting, and I had a long distance relationship, like New York to Hawaii, about a year and a half. I was coming here every six to eight weeks, I guess. And finally, I just bit the bullet and I moved. Cocoa Head Cafe is an island style brunch house. Uh, we opened in March of 2014. Uh, it's been gangbusters ever since. We're seven days a week, 7 a.m. to 2.30. And, um, you know, part of the reason is my, uh, my business partner, Kevin Haney, also owns uh, 12th Avenue Grill, uh, which was in the space that Cocoa Head Cafe is in now. And he moved it around the corner to a larger space. My walk-in is uh, six feet by five feet. So we don't really have the capacity to do dinner at this point. It would be too much. Um, we are, you know, my cooks are on 12-hour shifts as is. 
Uh, we, you know, when we first opened, we didn't know how popular it would be. We only have 56 seats and, you know, on a busy weekend, we'll do 350 to 400 covers. I am actually looking to move islands uh, probably this year, early next year. So either Maui or Kauai, but look for something new. It's on its way. Uh, I'm going to be here with the Surfrider Foundation, uh, also local EA and uh, fellow chef James Aptekin and uh, we're going to be talking about sustainable seafood in Hawaii and it's a it's an important issue you know it's not an endless supply of seafood that we have so it's really about how our businesses intertwine with working with environmental groups local fishermen and making sure that we're bringing the best product possible to our customers.